beloved people of God, good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is truly a joy to welcome you to Parkwood on this gorgeous, sunny, sunny morning. Thanks be to God for the sun. Am I right? Yes. Uh, so as we gather, a few announcements and reminders. Uh, there are a few things back on the information table to make you aware of. Um, first is there is still a sign-up sheet for our soup supper. That is happening two weeks from yesterday on February 18th at 5.30 p.m. So for those of us who don't like to drive at night, we made it a little bit earlier. Um, and we ask that you sign up so we know who's coming and let us know if you plan to bring anything. There are some options already on there along with, I think, other category. Um, so we're doing this potluck style. Um, I hope you'll come out and just enjoy some fellowship time together. No agenda other than soup and friends. So, also on the back table is a sign-up sheet. Um, you may have seen this in the press this past week. We are trying to make sure we have the most accurate computer records possible. So we have records of anyone who was ordained or served as an elder here at Parkwood, but if you were ordained as an elder in a Presbyterian church other than Parkwood, if you could leave your name and any other information you remember, on that sheet in the back, or if you need to do some research, um, send it to the church office. That would make our lives a lot easier so that we know who has been ordained as an elder specifically. Thankfully, we, we've kept track of all of the pastors in our midst. So, um, And last but not least is also a space to sign up to provide cookies and make coffee for Sunday Fellowship. Um, I know there are still some open slots there, so if that's something you would like to do, please do find a date that works for you and help us out. All right. I know Dennis has a moment for mission for us. This month's mission project, which has been ongoing, is um, the Ronald McDonald House and the Pop Top Taps. And I need visual aids. <laughs> Top top tab does a lot. I don't know if you're aware of what Ronald McDonald House does, but they provide housing and food and transportation for families who have children in medical care. And the lady seated behind me works two doors down from where the Ronald McDonald House is. So they do a lot. There's a container in the library room in one of the cabinets you can put the pop top tabs in and there's a container under the uh, easel in the lobby so please remember to bring your pop top tabs or your vegetable tabs to church with you and drop them in one of the containers thank you thank you Dennis all right do we have any other announcements reminders this morning things that I missed all right and with all of that said, let us worship God together. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs and I give thanks for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. He is Sarah, my home, and 
and the swallow of the nest for herself at their altars. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Now our hymn 267, Come Christians Join the <coughs>
chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. <laughs> Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 1975, a doctor by the name of Dr. Edward Tronick presented the results of what is now called the still face experiment at a conference. 
And it fundamentally changed how we think about child development and parent-child relationships. To this day, it is one of the most replicated psychology experiments in the world. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Awesome, we're all gonna learn things. Um, how the experiment works is this. A parent and a baby sit facing one another. For three minutes, the parent interacts with the baby, playing with them, talking to them, making faces, the things you do with an infant who can't speak yet. Then, the parent turns away. For two minutes, the parent does not interact at all with the child, and their face is completely neutral and still. Not scowling, just still. At first, in this two minute period, the baby will start cooing and babbling, reaching out toward the parent, maybe touching them or grabbing them. As the parent continues their still face, non-interaction, the baby becomes increasingly more desperate, crying, screaming, flailing, until usually they finally deflate and give up, withdrawing and just kind of staring into space. It's only two minutes, but babies obviously don't know that. After the two minutes is up, the parent once again turns toward the baby and interacts in the same way that they had before. And the baby is visibly relieved and excited and immediately goes back to playing and interacting with nothing but joy. This experiment and its successors revealed several things, but chief among them is that humans are hardwired for connection. And from a very young age, we will instinctively seek to reestablish a connection that's lost. In child development and psychology circles, this has led to the development of what's called attachment theory, which describes how these deep connections are formed, maintained, and perhaps lost or destroyed. From there, an attachment style reveals how a person might react when they feel a loss of connection with someone important to them a caregiver, a family member, or even a close friend. A person with some variety of what's called an insecure attachment style, sometimes described with words like anxious, disorganized, avoidant. For example, those folks might freak out and demand an explanation when a friend doesn't text them back immediately, or when a colleague is a bit short with them or they might simply shut down, assume that other person hates them, and never speak to them again. <laughs> Neither of those things sound particularly healthy, right? A person with secure attachment, on the other hand, might simply assume it's been a busy week and try again later, or that their colleague is stressed and let it go. For those folks, a moment of disconnection does not phase them, and it doesn't permanently alter their relationship. This experiment tells us a lot about human relationships, but it can also give us some insight as to how we interact with God. What happens when you feel like God is far away? Perhaps you feel like God has gone still-faced. Crispin Mayfield is a licensed counselor who wrote a whole book about those questions, using what science has learned from attachment theory to help us ground ourselves firmly in a secure attachment to God, no matter how close or far we feel in the moment. It's called attached to God. Imagine that. And it's actually a very practical guide to deepening one's spiritual life and finding spiritual practices 
that resonate with you. Why am I telling you all of this? One, because I love a good book that weaves together psychology, theology, and very practical resources. Yeah. I'm also telling you this because the Beatitudes, these words of comfort and hope that we have heard so many times, when it seems that God may be still faced, these words can help us reestablish and maintain that feeling of connection with God. Unlike the babies in those experiments, we grown folks have this thing called object permanence, which means that even when we don't see something with our own two eyes, we know that it didn't just cease to exist. Sometimes, though, we all need a little reminder. So thousands of years before we knew anything about attachment theory, Jesus sat on a mountain and gave us a whole list of scenarios where we might feel disconnected and discouraged. Perhaps we might even feel that God is ignoring us. And Jesus said, Blessed are the depressed and the grieving. Blessed are those who crave justice and righteousness and do not see the fruits of their labors. Blessed are those who do not get vengeance, but show compassion. Blessed are those who do the right thing simply because it is right, even when it disadvantages them. Blessed are those who take the high road, who work for peace and understanding when violence seems simpler. Instead of saying, blessed are those who have it all, Jesus seems to say, blessed are the burned out, the mocked, the unappreciated, the goody two-shoes, the hopeless optimists. So when we encounter these still-faced moments, when it seems like God has ceased to pay attention to the horrors of the world, Jesus offers us with these words a safe and secure place to rest. Harbor in the storm. A note in the mail to say, I know this is hard, but I am still right here. I see you and I bless you. Blessed are the warriors and the anxious, says the Lord, because I will sit and laugh with them in my kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, says Jesus, because I will wipe their tears with my own hands. Blessed are those who practice gentleness, because one day they will be your leaders and role models. Blessed are the ones who take the time to see people as they are, to work with them to create peace and justice, because they are the closest to my own heart, says the Lord. Blessed are those who are exhausted, discouraged, and frustrated for all of the right reasons, for I will draw near to them. I had a moment over the weekend where I was moving from room to room in my house, putting laundry away, doing dishes, cleaning off the dining room table, etc. And as I moved from space to space, I noticed that after a couple minutes, my dog, Hope, would follow me and just lay down nearby. When she noticed that I had moved on, she would simply follow and find a new spot in that room. I finally finished my chores, I sat down on the couch, and she hopped up to lay down in her little blanket nest next to me. She's not spoiled at all, I <laughs> But in that moment, she didn't want anything from me. She wasn't hounding me for treats or even a scratch behind the ear. She just wanted to be near me. In the same way, 
as we go about our harried and hurried lives. It is God who draws close to us. Not to push or demand or to scold, but simply because God wants connection as much as we do. We often hear that last verse of the Micah, Micah passage that Linda read for us, quoted in the context of a rallying cry for justice, a call to spiritual arms. And it can be that, absolutely. But that was not its original context. What Micah describes is a people who've forgotten their core story, who live in the midst of overwhelming greed, injustice, and corruption. And then, here you have the prophet Micah asking, what would it take to reestablish that connection with God? Asking, what sacrifices do you want? Bowls, oil, our firstborns? But what God wants from us is not necessarily a flurry of activi activity to impress or appease an angry, impatient God. What God wants for us and from us in Micah and in Matthew is simply a life defined by justice and mercy, where we rest securely in God's faithful presence. That's the, the whole thing, the whole shebang. The good news is that even when we feel far away, disconnected, or discouraged, God will always be seeking us out, reconnecting, reaching out, reorienting our hearts. Thanks be to God. invite us now to rise as you're able for hymn number 510, Come Share the Lord.
us more than anything else, this moment is a feast of connection. This is where we come to remember all that God has done for us, to connect with one another and with Christ. And we come to in hope, knowing that this is a small foretaste of the great banquet that awaits us in Christ's kingdom. So as we gather at this feast, let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all of its hosts and the earth with all of its plenty. You have given us life and being, and you preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus the Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation, for the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God in power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and the expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of our faith, saying, Christ, Christ is God, Christ, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ is come again. So send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless might be to us our communion in the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we might attain to the unity of our faith and grow up in all things into Christ Jesus our Lord. Just as these grapes have been gathered from many hills into one cup and these grains from many fields into one loaf, Grant, O oh Lord, that your whole church might soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The same night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat at table with his disciples. There he took bread, he blessed God for it, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. In the same way, after they had eaten, he took the cup, blessed God for it, and poured it out. He said, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood. As often as you do this, remember me. Friends, this is not my table. It is not Parkwood's table. It is not a Presbyterian table. And precisely because of that, absolutely everyone is welcome. So please participate today as you feel comfortable. In a moment, I'll have the ushers dismiss by rows, starting in the back. I'll have you come forward to the center, receive a piece of bread from me, and then go to the sides where the elders will place a cup on the table. We invite you to take it from the table, partake, and leave the cup in the basket at the end of the table. If you cannot come forward, Kay will come to you. I'll invite the servers forward. Come, 
All things are now ready.
God of grace, you promise to be with us to the very end of the age. And so for all of the ways that you connect us to one another and reach out to us to maintain our connection with you, we praise you and bless you. We pray that you would strengthen us for our work, our lives, in your world, that we may indeed love you and our neighbors well. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Friends, we have confessed our sins. We have reminded each other of our forgiveness. We have heard the word of God proclaimed. We have been fed and nourished at Christ's table. Let us respond by offering God what we hold as precious, whether that is money, time, or talents. <clears throat> He has no short-term memory at this point. He 
had the stroke on Monday, and he still doesn't know his wife or his children or her. Anything? Wow. Um, we will absolutely pray for him. Um, so for those in the back, um, Lynn's nephew, Chris, had a stroke this week. Um, he's quite young for that, 48, um, and is still having some memory issues. It's affecting him quite a bit. Um, so we will pray for him and for his family. God of grace, we praise you for your continual presence and attention for us. We praise you that we can bring everything to you, knowing that you hear us and see us and know us and love us. So God, we entrust all of our worries, all of our concerns, all of our joys to you this morning. We pray for Ron and Elaine as he makes this transition to memory care. God, we pray that you would give both of them your grace and your comfort in this process, um, that you would grant them everything they need uh, to be well. We pray to you for all those who are grieving for Fauna as she grieves the loss of her brother, for Delos's family and friends uh, as they gather to remember him tomorrow. We pray to you for all those who knew and loved Shane, that you would grant them your peace, your comfort, and your love. We lift up all those who are sick, who are recovering, we pray for Chris as he recovers from this stroke. God, we pray that you would grant wisdom and steady hands to all of his doctors and nurses. We pray that he would be able to recover not only physically, but mentally and emotionally, um, that you would heal his body and his mind so that he may know all those he loves. We pray to you for Courtney as she prepares to get some leg braces. God, we pray that this would indeed be the solution to her problems, um, that this would grant her relief from pain and discomfort, um, and that she would be well. We entrust our hearts to you. We also praise you for this new season, for our neighbors and friends at Holland First. We pray for Pastor Kathy, that you would grant her um, a long, healthy, and happy ministry in Holland. We pray too for Linda Mail as she transitions out of full-time ministry and into other things. We praise you for her faithful work in so many places, including here at Parkwood. And we pray that you would grant her rest and comfort and all good things. And now we lift our hearts and our voices together in prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'll now invite us one more. 
more time to rise as you are able for our final hymn. Thank you. 